Hello, I'm Megan Smick, the pastor of Oregon United Methodist Church. Last week, we talked about how we minister to each other with words and presence in times of grief. Words have a particular power right now. When we can't be physically near each other like we're used to, they can take on special importance, whether to uplift or divide. Today, I'm going to talk about our ministry of words and presence in times of difficult circumstances. Somehow, I kind of felt like that was relevant about now. We are in the midst of a global pandemic and all of its repercussions. To get us thinking, I would like to propose an imaginary dialogue to help us consider how we use words in the face of life's challenges. Imagine you have a friend who says to you, this is horrible. I've lost my job because of COVID. The rent and car payments are due and homeschooling my 10 year old is way harder than I thought it would be. How am I going to get through this? Would you say to her, you'll be fine. God never gives us more than we can handle. Or would you say, it's okay. Everything happens for a reason. If you were your friend and you heard these comments, how would you be feeling right now? Did these words help her? Maybe not. But we've all been there. We feel bad for our friend, but we don't know what to say. And in the pressure of the moment, we blurt out a platitude that may not be helpful. We are talking here about theodicy. There's your 25 cent word for the day, theodicy. It is the theology of when bad things happen. Since we've all been facing some bad things lately, Let's look at some of these platitudes because they represent some not so great ways to think about theodicy or how God is present when bad things happen. Let's start with everything happens for a reason. This comes from the idea that God directs all things for his purposes. It's supposed to be comforting. Because if a bad thing has happened to us, and it's something that God did, that makes it okay, right? Stop and think about that. Do all things happen because God directs it that way? And does that make everything that happens good? Let's take that statement to its logical conclusion. If it's true, then even things like people starving to death, child abuse, the Holocaust, 9-11, and 4,400,000 4, people dead around the world because of COVID is a good thing because it happens at the direction of God. Yay, it's okay. It's all a part of God's plan. Where does human choice come in? And what about the natural chaos of this world? Notice that when we go down this road of everything happens for a reason, it gets dark quickly. So let's talk about human will. Remember Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis? God created them and he put them in a beautiful garden to dwell in peace with him. And he gave them one rule. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Of course, it wasn't long before they did exactly that. And God turned them out of the garden because they refused to live according to his will. One of the many things that this story tells us is that right from the get-go, from the time of creation, God gave humanity the ability to make choices. This is part of what it means that we are created in God's image. Like God, we make choices about what we think and do. So if you cheat on your spouse, 
and it leads to a divorce, there's a reason for that. And it's not God. It's you and the choices that you made. This kind of difficult circumstance is not about God's will. It's about human sin and the choices that we make to not follow God's will. Sin can only exist if we have will, the ability to make choices. If God directs everything, then we don't have a choice about whether to sin or not. And if that's true, then the Bible ceases to make any sense whatsoever. Instead, God graciously gives us the ability to make decisions, and we can choose to follow him or to go against his will. Therefore, everything does not happen for a reason that has to do with God. Our human sin or someone else's is responsible for a lot of our pain. On the other hand, sometimes bad things happen not because of sin, but because of chaos. I'm talking about earthquakes, hurricanes, cancer, accidents, coronavirus. These don't happen to us because we have sinned. Instead, they are an unfortunate but natural part of our world. Sometimes when they happen, we say, why did God allow this to happen? I think to understand that, we have to first remember that we chose this world. God tried to make everything perfect for us in the Garden of Eden, but we chose not to live by his will. So God released us, and we no longer live under his perfection in a perfect world but under grace in an imperfect world. In this world, we make our own decisions, and in this world, there is chaos. And that means mudslides, wildflowers, heart disease, and car crashes. It's not about God letting these things happen. It's about God respecting our choice to live in this imperfect world where there is chaos. Shoot, that sounds bad, doesn't it? We are really in a pickle. But, but, in this imperfect world, we live under grace. There is a marvelous flip side to our predicament, thanks to the grace of God. We may sin, and cause ourselves and others grief. We may be the victim of the chaos of this world, but God uses our difficulties for his good purposes. Do you remember the story in Genesis of Joseph and his brothers? The brothers were jealous of Joseph, and so they sold him to slave traders headed to Egypt. A pretty heinous human sin. But God used this for good, helping Joseph rise to a position of power in Pharaoh's court. Later, the brothers were starving in a famine, and they came to Egypt looking for grain. Joseph graciously fed and sheltered them. And the brothers were sure that he was going to exact his revenge somehow. But he said to them in Genesis 50, 19 through 21, Don't be afraid. Am I God? You planned something bad for me, but God produced something good from it in order to save the lives of many people, just as he's doing today. Now, don't be afraid. I will take care of you and your children. So he put them at ease and spoke reassuringly to them. Here's the lesson. Even if we make bad choices, even if we sin, even if the chaos of this world overtakes us, 
God is able to weave all of this into his plan for good for us and for the world. Even in the midst of our most difficult times, God is working for our welfare. This is the power of grace, God's free gift of God's love. We are never alone, adrift in our circumstances. God is with us and acting in our lives to bring us blessing. Paul tells us in his letter to the Galatians, You are all God's children through faith in Christ Jesus. All of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. Nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now if you belong to Christ, then indeed you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. This tells us that we are not God's puppets. We are God's children. We are not God's playthings, random pieces in a great cosmic board game controlled by God for his pleasure. We are his beloved, the heirs to his kingdom, the purpose of his promises. There may be reasons for everything bad that happens. Some of it has to do with our sin. Some of it is related to the chaos of this world. But none of it is because God enjoys giving us a bad time as a part of his will. Now how about this comment as we face challenges? God doesn't give you more than you can handle. This one is actually based on a Bible verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, which says, No temptation has seized you that isn't common for people, but God is faithful. He won't allow you to be tempted beyond your abilities. Instead, with the temptation, God will also supply a way out so that you will be able to endure it. Sounds a little harsh, doesn't it? God allowing us to be tempted to the limit of our abilities. But there's something important we need to consider here in interpreting this verse. Paul wasn't writing to one overwhelmed person. He was writing to the Corinthians, plural. This is a corporate letter to a whole congregation of Christians. Together, they were prepared to handle temptation. Together, they were equipped to deal with their trials. Together, as the body of Christ, God enabled them to endure all things. Alone, we may feel helpless and overwhelmed when confronted with difficulties, but together we can find a way through. Together we have problems to be solved, not hopeless tragedies. Together with God, as the body of Christ, nothing is ever hopeless. Another problem I have with God never gives us more than we can handle is that the statement denies the fact that we are broken and need a savior. Remember the fact of sin and human frailty? How are we supposed to handle everything life and the world and our sin throw at us? We need Jesus for that. We need Jesus to forgive us to supply our strength, to give us courage and wisdom. If this statement were true, and we really could handle everything on our own, what would we need Jesus for? Do you need Jesus? If you do, then that's proof that you don't have to handle life on your own. We need Jesus' saving grace. Jesus says in John 16, 33, 
in this world you will have trouble but take heart i have overcome the world jesus himself saw a lot of trouble he endured perse persecution and ultimately death at the hands of his enemies trouble was a fact for the disciples he was speaking to all of whom endured persecution and most of whom were martyred trouble is a fact of human sin and worldly chaos notice that jesus didn't promise to take away our trouble he didn't say that it was god's will for us he didn't say that we are supposed to handle it alone or even that it won't be overwhelming he does promise to overcome it and that means being present to us in the midst of it that means providing us with strength courage and wisdom that we need it means giving us to each other as the body of christ so that together we can handle it when bad things happen jesus overcoming the world means that even when the worst occurs, God can still weave it into his plan for good for our lives. And ultimately, Jesus redeems our lives, trouble and all, into his kingdom. Let's pray. Compassionate God, we thank you for your presence in all of our difficult circumstances. We thank you for courage to face them, strength to fight them, your grace to overcome them. In those times, give us words of hope and peace. Give us the comfort of each other. Give us forgiveness to rise above our sin and vision to see beyond the chaos. Let us rest always in you. In the name of he who saves us. Amen. And now, family of God, go forth to speak words of hope and be the presence of Christ to the world. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.